Estimate. My clock just switched over to four, so we can go ahead and get started. All right, perfect. Thank you to everyone watching uh, on online and uh, on Zoom and on social media. I'm Liz Perry, Car Canyon's president. We are extremely excited to have our speaker today, Priscilla Tashini. I'm just going to do a couple of introductory uh, notes. Um, we always begin with our land acknowledgement that we acknowledge Kerr Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homeland our institution sits and where we work and live. Our mission-related work at Kerr Canyon would absolutely be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions uh, to all of humankind. We are grateful to all Indigenous people, and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions ancestral connections and sacred lands. This is tied directly to our mission to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education and American Indian knowledge. You can learn more about us at our website at crowcanyon.org. Um, I know everyone's familiar with Zoom, but you can grab the black bar and move our talking heads over to the side if, if you're not getting a good enough view of the presentation. Uh, as you have questions throughout the presentation, if you could please put them in the Q&A section instead of the chat so that they don't get lost, um, and we will be able to take some questions at the end. If your Zoom is giving you troubles, you can head over to our live stream uh, at, on Facebook, um, and also if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, we have these, these presentations archived there. And the next couple of weeks coming up, we have Bears Ears National Monument, digital documentation and virtual guided tours with Whitney Peterson and Jared Lindell. And then after that, we have Holes in Our Moccasins, Holes in Our Stories, Apachean Origins and the Promontory Caves with Dr. Jonathan Ives. So we hope to see you at both of those. Uh, without further ado, um, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Priscilla Tashini for her presentation through the lens of Navajo photographer. Uh, Priscilla is a member of the Navajo Nation. She is well known for her Southwestern landscape uh, and portrait photos and has uh, displayed and sold work throughout Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. And we are extremely excited to see some of these beautiful uh, works and hear her stories today. Thank you so much for joining us, Priscilla. Let's stop the share. Hi, thank you. Let's start here. Give me a moment here. Start my page. Yep, you're coming through. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Before I begin my presentation, I'd first like to say um, that it's an honor to be here. And I'd like to thank Crow Canyon for inviting me to speak to you about how I became a photographer, what photography techniques I've learned and how my work has evolved throughout my career. I was born and raised on the Navajo reservation and grew up in a, northern, in, um, in a small town called Kayanta, which is 20 miles south of Arizona, Utah border. My appreciation for the arts started when I was a teenager. It led me to a degree in graphic design. After working several years as a graphic artist, I felt it was time to find a medium in fine art. I enrolled myself into beginning digital photography class at a local community college. Once I obtained the basic knowledge of working a digital camera, I started to experiment and photograph different subjects that caught my eye. I found myself photographing landscapes more than anything else. So I began to travel to many scenic areas in Arizona, looking to capture the beauty of Mother Earth and Father Sky. Shortly after I completed my photography course, I entered a few of my photographs in the Arizona State Photography Competition and won several first place ribbons for my work. This gave me the confidence to start printing and selling my work at various Native American art shows, such as the Heard Museum, uh, Santa Fe Indian Market, and several other markets across Arizona, Utah, and Colorado.
through the lens of my camera, I began to see the details and beauty of the landscape and started to feel a connection with nature's subject and its energy. Each photo session was unique and it required me to apply a different set of technical and artistic considerations. My work in the field helped me appreciate and embrace the wonder of the earth and sparked a passion inside me that made me want to pursue photography as an art form. The working model I used when I first approached landscape photography was to get out there and practice, seek inspiration from other photographers and consider how they photographed the scene. Once I've gained the experience and the technical knowledge of working with my camera out in the field, I then had to learn how to process and edit the images on my computer using Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. My post-processing workflow took some time to develop. After several months of learning different processing procedures, I began to discard some of the procedures, favor others, and begin to develop new ones of my own. The editing process is an integral part of the art of photography, and so it's important to take the time to develop your own workflow so you can bring your own style to your photography. This photograph was taken in Monument Valley. The Navajo people believe that the mittens are hands reaching up from the world below. When I make a plan to shoot a landscape photograph, the first thing I have to do is decide on a location and figure out what it is I want to capture. Once the location has been determined, my next step is to do some research on the area. Understand what terrain is like under different weather conditions, find what the best times are of the day, and decide what time of time of the year is best to shoot the location. After viewing TV reports of spring flowers blooming in Arizona, I began my research for the best areas to capture the spring flowers and found this area at Bartlett Lake. I scouted an area the day before and began to work out my composition and decided that the best time to shoot this location was an hour before sunrise. The blue sky and the pink clouds complement the colors of the flowers and the plants in the landscape. Clouds of any type can make a scenery appear more dramatic and vivid. That can make a landscape more memorable. Most of the time, when I plan to go out to shoot a landscape, I will check the weather forecast for a mix of clouds and sun. The best opportunities for colorful skies is at sunrise and sunset. To set up for this shot, I arrived a couple hours ahead scouted the area, found a composing angle, and waited for the light to appear. This photograph was taken at Watson Lake near Prescott, Arizona. Watson Lake is a few miles away from my home and is one of my favorite local areas to photograph. For this image, I use a technique called focus stacking. Focus stacking is, a, is taking multiple photos of the same subject at different focal points to create one focus image from the closest foreground to the background. Um, for this image, I took three, uh, three photos, one for the foreground, one for the midground, and one for the background loaded the three images into Adobe Lightroom, made global changes to the images, and then transferred the files into Adobe Photoshop, blended the images together and finalized the editing process by making local changes to the merged image. This photograph is, a, is of Sipiku Falls, 
located on the Apache Reservation. One day, I decided to do a Google search for waterfalls in Arizona and found this location. Photographs of the waterfall inspired me to visit and photograph it myself. My husband and I spent several hours at this location, waiting for the right light to capture the movement of the water. Shooting towards the sun is a very difficult task for the camera to properly, properly expose the sky and foreground in one shot. When you correctly expose the camera for sunlight, the foreground will be dark and underexposed. When you correctly expose for the foreground, the sun will be over, overexposed and blown out. To get around this, you have to take multiple shots of the scene and blend them together to balance out the exposure between the foreground and the background. This technique is called exposure blending. For this image, I took three exposures, one for the foreground, one for the midground, and one for the sun, and finalized the merged image in Lightroom and Photoshop. This sunrise photograph was taken at Best Eye Badlands in New Mexico. I follow several landscape photographers on YouTube and thought this location was out of this world. So I made plans to visit this area last summer after Santa Fe Indian Market. This place was so amazing. The rock formations are so unique and incredible. I just had to see it for myself. I will definitely make another trip out. There is so much to see and the comp compositions are endless. Some compositions require extra room to balance the subject in the frame. To achieve a wider view of the landscape, a special technique of stitching overlapping images together to create, to create one single image is called wide format photography. To create this panoramic photograph of Bryce Canyon at sunrise, I took three sets of three overlapping images and stitched them together in Photoshop. Bryce Canyon has the greatest concentration of hoodoos on earth, according to the US National, uh, National uh, Park Service website. I have visited this, this area multiple times and shot it at various times of the day. The sunrise shots are my favorite, especially during the golden hour when the rock formations glow with bright orange colors. This photograph was converted to a black and white and processed using a high dynamic range technique. HDR can bring out micro textures in an image and enhance the details in the light and shadow areas giving it more of a contrasting and dramatic look. Many of my black and white conversions are inspired by works of Ansel Adams. As a nature photographer, I've become more aware of the deterioration of our planet's natural areas, industrial, residential, uh, agricultural and commercial expansion are resulting in climate change that is changing the landscape at an accelerated rate. Therefore, it's important for me to capture and document the beauty that still exists today. This photograph was taken from the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Smoke from a forest fire created this unique atmospheric view of the Grand Canyon. The brown and orange hues create a separation of layers between the plateaus and the mesas. Digital photography has made photography affordable and accessible to everyone. Most cell phones have quality cameras and editing softwares built in. As a result, 
anyone can now take a quality pictures, touch them up and share them online. The greatest accessibility that digital photography offers makes professional photography even more competitive. In the past two decades, fine art landscape photography has become more mainstream and it has become more difficult to differentiate myself from the rest. Everyone's work looks more or less the same and we've all gone and photographed the same locations. To set myself apart from the others, an artistic approach with no rules is sometimes applied to my landscape room, uh, work. This style of photography falls under the genre of contem contemporary landscape photography. This photograph started as a panoramic shot of Monument Valley taken from Hunts Mesa. Rather than looking at this viewpoint at a flat perspective, I wanted to give the viewer a feeling of floating into the scene. After two years of photographing landscape, I was ready to experiment with portrait photography. I found portraiture to be a little more challenging. It required me to learn more about lighting and posing. I had to pay more attention to the composition and the details in the image and learn how to capture the spirit of an individual in the portrait. Now I often seek to incorporate a hoop human subject into my images. Coming from a culturally rich background, it became important to me to capture the beauty of my people and share it with the rest of the world. Inspiration for this photograph came from R.C. Gorman, a Navajo artist who primarily painted Native American women. My idea was to capture an image that is simple and elegant, but impactful and bold, evoking emotion and thought of the subject. This is a self-portrait of myself taken at White Sands National Park in New Mexico. I always looking for creative ways to express my work and one technique I experimented with is called double exposure. Double exposure is a combination of two image, uh, exposures in one image to convey a deeper meaning and symb symbolic thought. For this image, I combined a portrait of my niece with a landscape photograph of Monument Valley. Beauty is central to Navajo life and thought. To create beauty within us, you have to acknowledge the beauty that surrounds us. It can change the perspective of life, the way we walk, the way we feel, and the way we think. We must do everything we can to maintain balance of harmony on Mother Earth. To walk in beauty means to walk in harmony, harmony with all things. Standing outside in total darkness, looking up into the starry sky is an activity I enjoyed since childhood. Switching from daytime to nighttime photography was a natural progression and was a great way to expand my skill set and gave me the opportunity to create unique images. Our naked eye can see the night sky in great detail. However, digital cameras have even greater abilities and can produce night photos with fantastic details of the night sky. These photos can be achieved by using the advantage of cameras with high ISO capabilities, fast aperture lenses, and long exposures. But shooting in low light situations does not come without its challenges. Noise and shallow depth the field is an issue I've dealt with. Once I've learned the proper techniques, finding and capturing the beauty in the dark became a huge personal reward for me. High ISO levels and shooting long exposures can create noise in an image. 
Noise is a grainy appearance and can distort the visual details of stars in, the, in a photograph. To help reduce this unwanted effect, <clears throat> I use a method called image stacking or um, star stacking. Star stacking is taking several photos in a row using the same settings and stacking the photos together in a post-processing software. A star stack stacked image not only has less noise, but also can bring out the colors and details of the night sky. The rock formations are next to a highway and were illuminated by a headlights of a passing vehicle. A single shot of the rock formations was blended together with the star stacked image to create this detailed photograph of the elephant's feet and the Milky Way galaxy. Shooting landscapes at daytime allows me to use a small aperture to, to get a large depth of field. At night time, I need every bit of light. So I opt for the widest aperture my lens can offer. A wide aperture allows more light into the lens, but has a shallow, a shallow depth of field. To get maximum, maximum uh, sharpness across the entire depth of this image, I use a, uh, the focus stacking technique. This traditional home called Hogan was captured at an aperture of F8 and blended together with a star stacked image of 1.8. The colors of the warm light and the cool night sky makes this image pop and is a wonderful example of how contrasting colors can make an image visually exciting. Painting with light is a photography technique where you illuminate parts of a scene with a light source to add emphasis to a subject during a long exposure. To set up for this shot, I first began by taking a quick exposure of the juniper tree in the foreground using a spotlight. Then a shot, a long exposure of the stars in the background and combine the images together in post-processing. Illumination of the mesa in the background was by chance and added depth to the scene. This photograph was taken in Monument Valley. This nightscape photograph of the Milky Way galaxy and San Francisco Peaks was taken near Flagstaff, Arizona. The photograph of the mountain peaks and foreground was shot after sunset when there was still some light available to capture the details of the landscape. Waited for the night sky to get darker. Once the Milky Way galaxy ap appeared over the mountain, I took the next set of exposure image stacked exposures and blended the two images together in pro-processing, post-processing. A forest fire behind the peaks gave an orange glow on the right side of the Milky Way galaxy, which made this shot of the night sky more colorful and unique. Shiprock is a is sacred to the Navajo people, it is known as the rock with wings. According to legend, it is the remains of a giant bird that carried the Navajo from the north to New Mexico. Shooting at night when the moon is present will soften the details of the stars and galaxy and gave it an overall bluish tint. For this image, the lighter blue colors of the moonlit sky complement the brown tones in the rock formation and foreground. When Comet Neowise was first spotted in March of 2020, a wave of excitement swept over me. I knew this might be my only chance to capture a comet 
So I started to come up with creative ideas for composition. I came up with a very interesting concept to capture the comment over fossilized dinosaur tracks. Problem was the dinosaurs uh, designed the dinosaur tracks I had in mind was located on the Navajo reservation which at that time was closed off to the general public because of the pandemic. So an artistic approach was applied to this image, making it a contemporary style of photography. My work continues to evolve. Conceptual photography is a form of art that uses the tools of photography to express ideas and concepts. An example of conceptual is when you formulate an abstract philosophy to explain the world, which cannot be proven or seen, giving the image a meaning beyond what is shown in the actual photograph. Transforming ordinary images into surrealistic images takes careful planning, precise uh, execution, and using various means of manipulation. I find it more challenging and gratifying to create images that come from a storytelling aspect. My goal is to create more cohesive bodies, bodies of work, images that have crucial meaning to my people and I, that is appealing to my uh, viewers on a deeper level, making them think about the image rather than just looking at it. Some of my conceptual art pieces are inspired by my cultural experience, experiences and teachings from the Navajo creation story. It's important to me to continue to live and grow and find new ways to present my work with retelling these stories from my own perspective. Here are some samples of my conceptual art pieces. The techniques I've used to create each image is extensive and complicated to explain. Rather than explaining the steps of how they came together, I will explain the message behind each piece. Navajo teachings say that all life form comes from yellow pollen. This is a portrait of a young woman offering corn pollen to the holy people. Normally, when an offering is made, the pollen falls to the ground but I chose to make the pollen go into a spiral direction. This spiral is also a sacred symbol to the Navajo. It is said that our spirit enters our body through the spiral pattern on top of our heads, known as the calic. Spiral patterns are everywhere. They appear on our fingertips and plant growth and in formation of galaxies. So for me, adding this spiral, to this portraiture has a significant meaning. This photograph was inspired by a story about the hero twins from the Navajo creation story. The hero twins are also known as the monster slayer. In the tale of the hero twins, the story recounts the tale of two brothers who travel across the land hunting and battling a race of monsters who were destroying human life. The son, who is their father, gave them weapons to help destroy the monsters. They eventually eliminated all the monsters and brought back peace and harmony to the Navajo people. Traditional teachings say that the fear and the disruption, disruptive um, negative things we bring into our lives are the monsters. Prayer, faith, and a relationship with the holy people are the weapons we can use against these monsters. The rainbow and lightning are important, uh, important elements in the story and were added to the photograph to complete their story. This area that this photograph was taken at is west of Tuba City. Uh, near an area where there are dinosaur tracks.
This photograph was inspired by a story from the Navajo creation story. First man, first woman, and the holy people laid out sacred stones on a piece of animal hide and planned out the constellations. As they were carefully placing each star, Coyote was watching in the distance. On the fourth day, he became impatient and grabbed the hide and threw the remaining stars in the sky and created the Milky Way galaxy. And um, Navajo belief, there is a male and female to all things above, below, and around us. Thunderstorm, lightning, and heavy rain represent the male rain. The landscape portion of the male rain is Canyon de Shea, which is, symbolizes the effects of heavy rain and rushing rock water carving into the land and creating canyons. Gentle, soothing, slow moving rain represents the female. The landscape portion of the female rain is Monument Valley, which symbolizes the effect of gentle rain, bringing moisture to the land, stimulating plant growth, supplying nutrients to all life forms. This concept piece was inspired by the story of the stars. In the Navajo creation story, first man and first woman and the holy people created the constellations to help the people understand the passage of time, growth, and aging. First man constructed a pattern called the male revolver, which is the Big Dipper, representing the paternal figure in the family. First woman constructed a pattern she called the female revolver, which is Cassiopeia, representing the maternal figure in the family. Both constellations revolve around the central fire, which is Polaris or the North Star, representing the central fire in a home. The moon, along with certain constellations, were used to measure the patterns of seasons. It helped signal when to plant, to harvest, when certain weather patterns were expected and when certain ceremonies should occur. Inspired by a story of, in the Navajo creation story, White Shell Girl was, used to in, was asked to enter into the moon by first man, first woman, and the holy people. Before she entered the moon, she asked for the authority to control the tides with her movements, and they agreed. The correlation of the young woman walking through the chaos of the clouds and the Navajo wedding basket she is holding up have sim similar meaning. The basket is viewed as a map through which the Navajo chart their lives. The inner white coils represent birth. As you travel outward, you begin to encounter some black. This represents darkness, struggle, and pain. As you make yourself through the darkness, you reach the red bands, which represent marriage and the creation of family. Traveling further outward, you begin to encounter darkness again, but is scattered by white light. The light represents increasing enlightenment, which expands until you enter all into the light, to the white in the outer rims of the basket. Um, the opening from center of the basket to the outer rim is the pathway to the light. The portrait of the young woman walking through the chaos of the clouds towards the light is seeking guidance from the holy people through ceremony and prayer and hopes for a prosperous future in health, knowledge, relationship, and spirituality.
You can purchase any of these photographs by visiting my website and Etsy shop. <clears throat> Both the links are at the bottom. Here are some types of photography prints I provide for my customers. Uh, my matte prints are printed on professional uh, photography paper and matted with acid-free mats and matte boards. They are placed inside a protective plastic bag and come in standard frame sizes. Here's an example of my matte prints. You can purchase my matte prints through my Etsy shop at etsy.com slash shop slash squash blossom photos. My aluminum metal prints are printed by a professional photo lab. Here is an example of what the metal prints look like. The image is inkjet, uh, the image is inkjet printed, pressed on a sturdy aluminum panel using innovative dye simulation process. The ink is infused into the coating of the metal print, providing protection and durability. The print has a high gloss luminous base with a reflective finish. The back of the print has a back, uh, black inset metal frame with a wire hanger. I particularly like this type of um, print, especially for my conceptual art pieces and nightscapes. I consider this print as a higher end product for my photography. The colors are more vivid and will not fade over time. It comes ready to hang and it's easy to care for. You can purchase my metal prints through my website at squashblossomphotos.com. Okay, this concludes this portion of the presentation. I'd like to turn this time back over to Liz and answer any questions our audience may have. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Uh, um, I'm stunned. Everyone uh, I, uh, is, has been stunned by by your visual imagery. Just incredible. I, I would read a few of the comments uh, uh, from the chat. Lots of gorgeous, stunning work, outstanding. Um, uh, one of our participants wanted to point out that you're truly a creative and talented photographer, that the photos are, are moving and the audience said they really appreciate your explanations for how you created them. Um, absolutely, that, that's been a huge, uh, <laughs> really powerful. Uh, some, some folks said they loved your creative idea for, for the comet, that is with the, uh, with the, the dinosaur tracks, uh, just absolutely exquisite, imaginative, wonderful, yeah. stunning, beautiful, thought-provoking. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. There, we do have some uh, some questions from from the audience, and I have some questions too. But we'll go ahead and, and okay. take the audience questions first. Um, kind of early on, some folks asked about, um, uh, and I know you gave some explanation, but about the post processing work. Uh, maybe how much uh, how much do you do? How how much time does that does that take you? Um, it depending on the the. Uh, the subject. Um, my landscape sometimes will take, I have to take multiple exposures to blend them together so I can have a even, um, uh, to have the focus points and everything, to have a wider depth of fill. Um, also, um, my nightscapes also, it takes a lot of exposures and blending. And then also after post-processing all that it takes it takes a lot of time there's it's it's not like a a quick you know shoot and then process it on the computer right. and it's done it, it it goes through a lot um, um my conceptual pieces take hours um i don't know between sometimes it'll take me almost 40 hours to put one piece together so I really work mm -hmm. meticulously. I make sure that everything um, uh, looks uh, looks you know the the blending and everything looks 
really good and every all the colors will complement each other and try to make it look like it i actually shot it that way you know my conceptual pieces so uh it it depends it really the whole process <laughs> of photography is very extensive from just planning from coming up with the uh, composition and planning it and getting there to the to the to the location and waiting for the right light and I mean it, there's a whole I mean and then getting the shot and then taking it back and processing it so it's it, it's a big thing <laughs> it's a big process right. <laughs> a lot of work <laughs> no I can I can tell yeah. Um, since it seems like we, we have, I'm going to try to combine some of the technical questions because it does sound like we have some yeah. camera aficionados. So, um, so I'm just going to put a few of those out there and let you talk about it. People are interested in what, what camera or cameras do you use? Um, the lenses you prefer for nightscape and low light, um, <laughs> the apps, you know, that you might use, uh, <laughs> rather than kind of asking because there's there's some re repetition i thought um the audience kind of wanted to see if you would talk a bit about about your cameras the technology the apps the lenses that sort of thing oh okay well throughout the years i um upgraded from camera to camera to camera i started with a uh, nikon d50 upgraded it to a nikon d90 went to a nikon d750 and now I have a new Nikon mirrorless camera, Z7 II. So I try to stay up, you know, every once in a while I have to upgrade my camera, keep on top of that. And then the lenses that I use um, for my nightscapes, um, I just recently purchased a 14 millimeter Samyang 2.8. I'm just now starting to play with that. Um, uh, a lot of my other um, nightscapes I've shot with a 28 millimeter, 1.8. Um, and then I have like a 50 uh, millimeter, 1.8 and an 85, 1.8. And I have a zoom lens, 28 to 300. So I have a couple of lenses um, that I work with. But um, for my landscape shots, I, I tend to stick to my 28 millimeter. Um, and I use that as a, a lot for my um, nightscapes as well. So um, unless I'm going to really come in and shoot in close, then I'll use my, my, my other lenses as well. So uh, the software um, for the... Uh, Uh, a lot of photographers use photo pills. Um, it's an app that will help you um, determine, you know, uh, when the moon phases are uh, best times for Milky Ways and um, stuff like that. But um, uh, I haven't downloaded that to tell you the truth. I just kind of um, keep an eye out of my own. I go on the internet figure out when the moon rises. And uh, I've really still, over the years, I've studied the uh, what point of year the Milky Way comes up and at what point of the night, you know, that it's a, a great time to shoot it. So it's, it's, it's all like, uh, I just kind of depend on my, my own uh, judgment or my own um, experience on that part of it. Thank you. Um, we've had some some questions, a couple of questions about uh, your influencers. You, you mentioned in the beginning when you when you were talking about getting started that you you looked for inspiration from other photographers, and you mentioned Ansel Adams. And so uh, I was wondering if you if you could talk a little bit about about your influences and uh, how that helped you develop your photographic eye. Um, my first influence was. Um, He's the Navajo photographer, actually. He was, um, he has his own um, Arizona Highways. Um, he's published a book 
his name is um, Leroy DeJoyle. He was my first um, influence. Um, he's got incredible work and I've seen his work um, at the art shows. So he was my mm -hmm. big influence. Um, um, other than that, I just, I follow a bunch of different photographers on YouTube. There's a whole plethora of different photographers different in different genres. Um, but he was my first inspiration. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, in your conceptual work, which um, just incredibly creative and different and striking, um, it, it struck me that the the storytelling through those um, uh, through your through your conceptual photographs are very educational uh, as, as well in terms of communicating about uh, traditional culture. And I was wondering if you uh, think about uh, what are you trying to educate in some way and, and are there um, audiences in particular, whether it's um, uh, Native American youth or non-Native people uh, that you might be interested in um, being the recipients or the audience of this, of this kind of education and storytelling? Um, I really don't know a whole lot. A lot of it I research and there's actually a, um, a, um, a man I follow on YouTube, he's a uh, Navajo, he's, um, I can't remember his name by the top of my head, but I listened to a lot of his, his talk about the culture. Um, my parents and my grandparents didn't really have a whole lot of knowledge and weren't, you know, they didn't teach or were able to hand down a lot of it to me. So a lot of it I have to do on my own. Um, and, uh, so I just, you know, just reading it online and talking to um, uh, elder people and, and a lot of the um, artists that are at the shows really share a lot of insight on, on, on things and suggest, make a lot of suggestions to me of what I should put together or, you know, um, share stuff like that. So I listen to a lot of what they, um, talk you know the stories and stuff like that so I'm not very um I don't know a whole lot <laughs> to tell you the truth though so, but um I try to use my photography though to educate um people um and there's there's a whole lot more I have a whole lot more to share I there's so much ideas it's just um coming up with the um the timing of the landscape and 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 sometimes having models finding models and stuff like that that's that's the that takes a lot of time so yeah i'm sure <laughs> when i was looking at some of the pictures you showed early in your presentation that watson lake image really stuck with me just spectacular the civic falls the um, the Bistai Badlands, and I was trying to um, picture you out there setting up for those photographs. You, 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 one of them you'd, you'd mentioned that your husband and, uh, and you were out there for, for hours, and I was wondering if you could describe sort of your process when you're actually out on the landscape. Um, I think it was the um, uh, the the Badlands one in particular, right, with the the alien, you know. <laughs> Uh, pods uh, in, oh, in, the, yeah. uh, in the in the distance. I was wondering. I was trying to picture you kind of walking around and trying to find uh, different shots. And I was wondering if you could kind of share some of what that's like when you're out actually what on it, the landscape oh. and and what you're thinking and what grabs you. Well, um, I like I said, I I I follow a, a lot of um, YouTubers, and I saw one of them had made a trip out there and was photographing that particular area and I was I was like wow I have to go there that's so interesting so um it started from that and so after Santa Fe Indian Market coming back across that that location is located north of um Chaco Canyon and it's south of mm -hmm. Farmington New Mexico so I did my research finding the area Google mapped it. Um, and then um, 
really use Google Earth to kind of zoom in and kind of see how far it was from the parking area to that particular <laughs> area. Because what I had in mind was I was going to shoot it in the morning before sunrise. And I knew, I didn't know the distance from the parking lot to, to that particular area. So I had to do research. I figured out it was about almost two miles. So then I said, okay, this is, it's going to take this long to get to that area. And then I'm going to have to um, figure out what I'm going to shoot. So we actually got up um, while it was still dark. I, I, I think probably about 4 a.m. in the morning. And we just started heading in that direction. And it was dark. <laughs> but <laughs> looking at the little map, the Google thing, and I just start looking at the land, um, the landmarks and saying, okay, I think it's in this direction. We just got lucky, really. As it started getting lighter, and we started looking at the, and I thought, okay, I think it's, we're almost there. So we got there and um, hurried up and, and looked for a composition because the sun was, you know, rising. I had at least half an hour to look for something. So it was, you know, normally I would go there the day before and um, look for a composition and then return the next day. But because this was like just a quick trip, there was another area the day before we went to, um, which is uh, not too far from there. We, and we stayed there late that evening and took some photos there. And so I didn't have the time to uh, scout that area uh, the day before. So sometimes, it, you know, we don't have the time. So you just have to make it work somehow. <laughs> Sometimes you just cross your fingers and you hope something for something. And a lot of times I, I've been to the Grand Canyon and I have a certain composition in my mind or, oh, it'd be great to have the, this weather, the lightning or whatever. And I've been there like so many times and it's never worked out, you know, maybe once <laughs> ago, I get lucky. So, so, um, yeah, we, great. Uh, the one, one funny thing is when we got up at four in the morning and we headed out that way and we probably got maybe half a mile and I realized I left my tripod. So my husband had to, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He's like, go ahead, stand right here. I'll, I'll have to go back and go grab the tripod because <laughs> there's no way I can shoot without one. So mm -hmm. um, he left me standing there in the dark, which was kind of eerie. <laughs> I mean, it's like out in the air <laughs> and you don't know if there's any coyotes or anything out. And so it was, it was a little bit scary waiting for him to come back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, every, 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 uh, photo expedition has some kind of, uh, interesting story behind it as well, but yeah, a little bit of an adventure. Uh, yeah, to there's, that always, one. there's always an adventure almost every <laughs> single time. So <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, kind of speaking of you know, the lighting, lightning and lighting. Uh, one of our um, uh, particip participants asked, uh, said the quality of the dark sky uh, in your area is incredible. Do you have to search a lot for uh, an absence of light pollution when you go out to, to photograph? Um, yeah, um, in my, where I live in Prescott, there is um, a lot of light pollution. Um, so I prefer to go to the Napa Reservation, which is the light pollution there is a lot less. There is still some there, but it's not as uh, not as bad as because Prescott is not too far from Phoenix. So you get a lot of the light pollution from Phoenix, the city. So, um, yeah, I have to consider that a lot. Um, um, that's why I like to go to the Napa Reservation and, and shoot out there. Um, 
have a, a better chance at it, getting a, a really nice uh, galaxy shot out there. Okay. Uh, you've also gotten a lot of compliments on your ideas with the dinosaur footprints. Um, oh. Someone uh, wanted to know uh, if they were from Antelope Canyon or where, where you were finding your dinosaur footprints for your for those photographs. The that dinosaur track is actually um, just west of um, Tuba City, Arizona. Uh, I don't know what the highway is, but it's right, just right outside. But <laughs> If you're heading from Flagstaff to to the Navajo Reservation, um, before you get to uh, Tuba City, um, there, there's a pull off right there, and it's the, they have a big sign that says Dinosaur Tracks, and those <laughs> are right there. <laughs> They're right, kind of, oh, <laughs> uh, you know, not too far off the road. Um, but yeah, that's that's the only location that I. Um, I passed through there going back and forth from there. And I've always had that in mind, in mind. I have to shoot that dinosaur track, but I need to do, I need something, something interesting to pull it together. And uh, uh, the comment was just, uh, perfect for that shot. Um, I wish I could have been there during the same, you know, and shot it in actual photograph of it together. But they, uh, the pandemic, they, the, the Navajo reservation was closed off. Um, they wouldn't allow anybody um, other than the resident. And so um, I, couldn't, I couldn't be there during that time when, when the comment came through. So, but I just, I couldn't get that out of my mind. And I said, I have to, I have to do it. Somehow I got to pull it together. <laughs> So it worked oh, out. I mean, it looks amazing. It looks amazing. I mean, in the comet and dinosaur footprint contest <laughs> is just yeah. really powerful and fun. Mm -hmm. um, I also loved the the wide format uh, photography that you that you explained, and it looks like right behind you is the maybe the Bryce Canyon yes. uh, wide format that that you had um, talked about. Do you have a sense? Um, do you, uh, when you go out that you want to do the wide format work or what, what inspires you to want to use that particular technique on the landscape? Yeah, some, some landscapes require um, a wider format. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, my, my lens is wide, but it's sometimes you just need more. You just need to, you want to take in more of it. So, um, when I was there, it had a, it was a smaller view of it. And then I said, no, it's got it. I got to get a bigger view. So it just, some places just require that. So if you can make it work and great. <laughs> <laughs> So what's what's coming up next for you? What do you have any any sort of particular uh, themes or or projects in mind that uh, that are in your future? Um, yeah, right now because of the um, um, d before monsoon season, every year um, we get a lot of clear skies. So right now I'm I'm trying to work on new um, compositions of um, the night sky trying to um i have some some new techniques that i want to try so i'm just waiting for the moon to uh go off a little bit right now it's too bright to photograph the night sky with the moon so i'm just waiting for that that's my main project right now is coming up i have an, i have several ideas and um just getting ready for i have um art fairs coming up so i got to get my inventory ready for that and Santa Fe in the markets coming up. So um, there's a lot of other things that I have in mind uh, as for conceptual work. I have something in mind. I just waiting for a certain uh, weather pattern to, to make that work to come together. I love that. Wait, waiting on the weather to complete your conceptual picture. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great, yeah. great idea. Yeah. 
Right. Well, we're right about at five o'clock, so I think we will we will let you go. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Just spectacular imagery, and I know that you have now gotten a whole bunch more fans if you didn't have them already uh, from our from your talk today. So, oh, great. really, really grateful for your time and for sharing your process with us. Oh, well, thank you, Liz and uh, Pro Canyon, for putting this together. Um, it's been an honor and a privilege to be part of this um, online presentation. Thank you all who joined us for the Zoom presentation and um, uh, many blessings to everybody and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an honor for us to have a, have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you.